Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sumha sambhurasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sumha sambhurasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sumha sambhurasa Purang dhammang sangang namasami So uh, welcome to Clear Mountain's weekly Wednesday live stream. This is when we get a chance to talk uh, a bit more or discuss things a bit more informally. So feel free to type anything you'd like into the chat and I should be able to um, address it later. But I did want to start um, the evening just with the topic or kind of dropping this into the mix of advice to those interested in ordaining, not because I think it's something most people will do. And that's an important caveat at the beginning of this is that uh, not everyone will ordain. That's not everyone's path. Um, and yet the advice to people who are interested, um, I find is relevant to others as well um, who aren't explicitly on that path. Um, I think the monastic archetype lives in all of us to some extent. Um, and the ways which one can navigate that um, and how monastics I know have navigated it is relevant, I think, to, to others as well. So hopefully this is of use. I think the, yeah, so I think this archetype of the monastic really does uh, live in most of us. Um, there's that moment of recognition of the path and of encountering a teaching which feels profoundly uh, relevant and powerful, which many of us remember. Um, I think Long Sumeda was a Navy medic uh, on a ship in the Pacific, and he read two paragraphs of a book by D.T. Suzuki and thought, oh, I'm a, I'm a Buddhist. And um, I know for me, it was when I was 15 and re reading Herman Hesse's Siddhartha. Um, and one thing I think is uh, the other story, I, one of my favorites, um, it was a friend who was so inspired by the image of a monk that he uh, dressed in white immediately got a bowl, I think a golden bowl, and went to his room and told his mom to bring him food. So I don't know if she actually did it, but uh, yeah, when the archetype hits, when that aspiration strikes, it can uh, be strong. And I think some people and most of us have somewhere in our minds and hearts that idea that maybe one day um, or if this happened, maybe. And I know for some people that can split them where they always wonder what could have been um, if they hadn't gotten the job, if they hadn't gotten married. And they can take the fact that that splinter of the transcendent and of that possible path lives in them as an indication that they took the wrong fork or at least that they didn't go down a road they, they wish they'd explored a bit. And that's fair enough, um, but I think it's important to see that because the monastic form is archetypal, it's meant to live in us. Just because the splinter of it stays in us, just because there's throughout our lives that thought of what if or maybe someday it doesn't mean we took the wrong, you know, we all live the lives that we, um, that conditions and uh, causes led us to. And wherever you find yourself right now, that's where you are. And honoring that kama um, and that dhamma, uh, Venerable Buddha Dasa said, dhamma is duty, is our task now. And the fact that that archetype lives in us um, 
is a good thing because it's a lighthouse, but it's one among many lighthouses, uh, one among many guiding stars, which should uh, move us through life. So one story I like to tell, and I just think this is an important caveat to put at the beginning of this whole discussion is, um, I know one man who was very intent on in ordaining and um, he couldn't, uh, he, he had a, a kid that he wasn't, that wasn't, um, that he had a duty to basically. And the teachers told him so. And he returned back home and he made it his entire path, his practice to care for his child and live out the best life as a father he could possibly live, to pour himself into that dhamma, um, into that role. And he said that he kept the first three paramitas, the spiritual perfections, almost as mantras of uh, uh, the first three are dana, giving. So what can I give in this moment? Nekama, uh, renunciation. What can I give up in this moment? And I think the third um, might be such a truth. Mm. Anyways, I'm forgetting the third right now. Forgive me. Um, but by giving himself completely to that dhamma um, of being a father, he became more monastics than most monastic. I monastic. He became more monastic than most monastics I know. And I think that's the danger of assuming that there's this, of regretting um, this other path that you might have taken or wonder about, is you can you, then you don't sometimes give yourself fully to where you are, and. Like my teacher Long Pornan says, the, the true monastic is in your heart. Um, you ordain in your heart. Um, so taking that and understanding that this splinter of the transcendent um, or this aspiration or image of a monastic um, and sort of wondering, uh, it's good to have in you as one star among many. And you have, likely have many other obligations, ties, aspirations that you have to honor in this life. And that's um, a landscape you can balance. So that being said, um, if one is free to ordain and interested, and this is going to be a, a talk somewhat biased towards um, a male path towards ordination, because that's what I'm familiar with in the Thai forest tradition. And this is a, it's a significantly harder landscape to navigate for women right now. Um, and that's very regrettable. Um, what I can speak to most is the male form, but we can touch on uh, some of the pieces of advice, hopefully are relevant for every, everyone. And please feel free to type anything uh, that comes up into the chat if you're interested. Um, there's a famous sutta uh, called Hard to Do. It's in the Samyutta Nikaya, the, uh, the Connected Discourses, and it's by Venerable there's a lay person who asks Venerable Sariputta, uh, what is hard to do in this discipline? And Venerable Sariputta says, in this discipline, it is hard to go forth. And the questioner asks a follow-up question. When one has gone forth, what is hard to do? And Venerable Sariputta says, when one has gone forth, it is hard to be content. And he, then the questioner asks, when one is content, what is hard to do? And Venerable Sariputta says, when one is content, it is hard to practice in line with the Dhamma. And the questioner asks one final question and says, if one practices in line with the Dhamma, uh, will liberation take long? And Venerable Sariputta says, not long, friend. So this threefold division um, or path, the first going forth, what is hard to do in this discipline going forth? Right now, I think people, um, you know, for myself, this practice began to grow in, in power over time. I began meditating when I was in my teens. And by the time I was out of college, the aspiration had just become strong enough that it, it drew me. Um, and I find people, you know, when you're at a monastery and someone emails saying they want to come ordain, uh, there's always a bit of caution because 
some people are doing it to run from something or they are so inspired that they immediately want to drop everything and come and in a, a way that's not balanced or necessarily honoring the comic ties they have or where they're at. So a really good first step is to not, people can get really caught in this sort of decision. Um, do I uh, go off to a monastery and sell all my things or do I stay here? And so often it's good just to walk people back from the edge and say, just go visit a monastery first for a few days or for five days. If it feels good, if it works out, then go again for maybe seven days. There's no need to run into things, but the archetype and the draw can be so powerful that people get kind of what we call rogue fever and they uh, begin to consider it this enormous decision, decision right from the outset. So it's good just to remind people like, go explore um, uh, these different monasteries while you have the ability. And even if you don't ordain, the worst that's happened is you've gotten to spend time uh, in monastic communities around good teachers. There's no downside. Um, and intellectually working your way through this decision is, uh, I think, pretty impossible. There's a teacher that says kama is intuition or intuition is kama. And with something like this, you need to go to the place and feel it in your body. Um, you need to sort of feel how, how it is to be in a community. And different communities, just like people, have different personality types. Um, often in Buddhism, we talk about them based on the dominant defilement of greed, uh, aversion, or delusion. Communities will have a dominant personality type as well, greed, hatred, or aversion. Um, and often those mature into greed, into faith, uh, aversion into wisdom, delusion into sort of a spaciousness. So it's sometimes very good to find a community that balances your natural inclination by sort of giving you a nice pinch of the opposite. Um, so in the uh, North America, I really recommend uh, Abayagiri is just such a good community to visit. In Thailand, Wat Pananachat, the uh, monastery for Westerners near Ajahn Chah's is an amazing training monasteries. monastery, as is Wat Mapjan, where I ordained with Longport Anan. Um, in Europe, you have, and this is not an exhaustive list, there's other monasteries in North America and elsewhere that could be very wholesome for people. And once again, these are male communities because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, in Europe, Amravati or Chithurst are, are really good. And so just going and spending time. Um, and if uh, one danger is, is people go and they really want, um, it can be very inspiring to come across situations where you get a lot of time to practice and you're near say a, a quite uh, impressive teacher um you're on your own maybe it's a small community of in thailand say five or six practicing uh thai monks and then you um, if you're a westerner and i've almost never seen that work in the sense of um it it, it can work for Western monastics to live with Thai or other nationalities, obviously. But this focus on uh, seclusion right from the get-go, um, I've seen rarely succeed unless one goes forth under a teacher that really takes one under his wing. So uh, with Longpur, Ajahn Jeff, uh, he was under the tutelage of Longpur Suchat, or sorry, um, Longpur Fung. Um, and uh, Longpur Suat uh, and other monks I know who've done the same have really been the main upatak or assistant of their teacher. Uh, Ajahn Dick was under Longta Mahabua and with them constantly. But in the absence of that, having community is just essential. Um, having a really robust, caring community that will take you in. And Honestly, so it's just a standard line for people going to a monastery of really wanting to 
um, go off alone and you'll get people come to these communities and they'll be like, there's too much work. Um, I just want to go practice in seclusion. It's almost a hundred percent of new monastics say this uh, or aspiring monastics. I certainly did. And what you don't realize is the practice won't always go well and you need a community of people to hold you. The seclusion will come. Um, if you're really in this for the long haul, then you can put in a few years to get a good training, to learn how to sew your robes, to learn the vinya, to learn the dhamma, to be held by a community. And as uh, moderns, we are so isolated. You read the suttas and you hear the Buddha encouraging um, his disciples to go forth into the wilderness. And that's true, but he was also giving those contact, those teachings in the context of a society that was profoundly integrated and to people with impressive samadhi uh, concentration in general. Uh, there's a wonderful sutta where the Buddha compares a monastic who does not have concentration uh, deciding to go to the wilderness um, to a cat who sees an elephant going and playing in a pond uh, spraying itself with water and the elephant is analogous to a, a practitioner with deep concentration going to the wilderness and so the cat says I too will go play in the pond and it just gets wet and miserable um, similarly uh, a practitioner with little concentration going off alone uh, ends up like a wet cat and just love the Buddha's imagery so first you have to learn to live in community and then you can come and live alone. And you really see this in, this is the success of the Ajahn Chah lineage is, and it's lower attrition rates, is it focuses on communal living. Um, a Bayagiri, for example, the morning work period, you'll be with people and you do get afternoons off uh, in, for free, free time. You get three months a year for winter retreat and a lot of seclusion, but a lot of your life is living with people and you see what that does to a heart and it's beautiful. There's a sutta called the Seleka Sutta, effacement in the Majjhima Nikaya where the Buddha says, concentration is a pleasant abiding here and now. I do not deny it. But as to how effacement uh, is, a practice, is practiced in full, listen and I will speak. And then he lists 44 different methods to uh, basically purifying yourself by the way of non-greed, one gives up greed, by the way of humility, one gives up arrogance, and so on. So the training is robust. And having seen the difference between practitioners who in the West only go on retreats alone, focusing on a single technique, versus people who've integrated their life into a community and really work to live with people um, it's so impressive what that does to people's hearts. Uh, and it, it's also funny, like I asked Long Parpasano about living with people and he said, living with people, it's, it's terrible. Ha ha ha. And, uh, you know, it's hard, but it's also the best thing in the world. It's what we're meant for. So focusing on community. And the thing is to have the expectation you can find an arahant, to train under and a good community that's in the perfect place in the right climate, it will never or almost never happen. The monastery will never be quite right. And what I'd say is if you go visit a few places beforehand um, and trust over time, you'll get a chance to touch into these teachers and build connections. And then you can call them in the future. So, you know, I, I I call Ajahn Jeff for uh, advice sometimes, or Long Parpasano, Ajahn Jayasaro. Um, but you don't need to live with them constantly. What's more significant is what the daily schedule and training in a monastery is like. What's the community like? Because that's what's going to determine every other moment of your day. And, uh, you know, for example, Wat Pananachat, the abbot, is Ajahn Kevali, um, who doesn't consider himself sort of a, a, a Kruba Ajahn, we call him, like one of the enormous teachers in Thailand. But he's a wonderful monk and, and a good teacher. Um, but what he does beautifully is 
he, the Korwat, the way that monastery embodies the tradition and training, it's like Longpur Cha, Ajahn Cha is right there training you. And in a lot of ways, because that's Longpur Cha's Korwat. That's Longpur Cha's, Korwat is the term for monastery etiquette and culture and how a Vinaya is embodied. Um, that's Ajahn Cha's training right there. So prioritizing that and community and trusting that you'll gain the connections with the teachers you need and you'll be able to, to talk with them when it's relevant. And yeah, for those first round of visits to monasteries, uh, go have fun with it. Go visit a bunch of different ones. You won't get as much chance as a young monk or a, a nun. So go touch base with those teachers, form the connections, um, and you'll feel intuitively. Uh, when I stepped into Wat Mapjan, I knew within two days, that's where I wanted to ordain, just trusting that. And if you get caught into ordaining in the West versus ordaining in Asia, um, know that wherever you ordain, generally they, people tend to balance out. So after five years as a monastic, you're allowed to go elsewhere and release from dependence. And usually what happens is monastics that ordained in Thailand or Asia will come to the West. And those who ordain in the West will go to Asia and a balance can be achieved. So it's not, um, you're not making a decision for your entire life. The final thing I, I wanna say on this is uh, to really prioritize a tradition with strong, strong Vinaya uh, monastic code and trusting that. Um, also look at the quality of the monastics you're meeting in terms of their happiness. Do they seem warm, um, happy, happy monastics? It's, uh, and are there a decent number over five years, five vases? That's really important. My experience is that faith, that initial booster of faith will carry people about five years. But if you haven't found a happiness in the robes after that, no matter how much you had, how much love of the tradition you had going in, the heart needs to be fed and nourished. And so look for how many monastics are there after five, you know, above five years and take that attrition rate seriously. Um, that's a good indicator of how many happy senior monastics you're, you're having. Okay. The next bit, and this is the most significant, I think, or one of the most is, um, oh, just one more thing. If you have this metric in your head of, um, I, you know, people don't want, my family doesn't want me to do this. Um, my friends don't want me to do this. First of all, you do need your parents' permission. Um, but I know uh, monastics who have, uh, like Ratapala, laying on the ground, not eating for a few days until they got permission. That's kind of intense, but, and I don't know if I'd say that's the right path for everyone. Um, but it is worth noting that the power of the merit you give your parents by ordaining, and not necessarily in just this esoteric economy of merit, but for them to recollect they have a child in robes and for what that does to their hearts, um, for them to come and visit you, even begrudgingly at first and see what this does, for them to see how your peers, you know, often will find addiction or this or that, and you seem happy and moral, that has a huge effect. And almost 100% of parents come around in the end. So having faith in that, and also having faith that even those people who are initially hurt or annoyed or angry at you leaving, you're giving them a gift. People in your life do not need another person to go to coffee with or a movie with, but there will come a time maybe when they're getting divorced or the cancer comes or the parent dies and they remember you, that someone in their life had the sincerity and devotion to step forward on a path and you will be more meaningful to them in that moment than you could have possibly been otherwise. And this doesn't just apply to those ordaining. Um, this is everyone in the path. I think we've all felt that tension with old relationships and moving deeper into practice and feeling the tension there. But know that this is a gift. It's, it's a great gift. And I can really attest to that. Um, you come back home after five or six years as a monastic and people you had no idea would be moved are. And those who were averse to it, 
they get the picture that you're, you're all right after a while, or sometimes they just kind of forget about you. It's not terrible. So the uh, next thing I just want to uh, speak about is what Venerable Sariputta said next. Once one has gone forth, what is hard to do, to be happy, to be content. And this is essential. Longpore uh, Pasano, as many of you know, says, you know, we have it all backwards. We think first we get our samadhi, our concentration together, and then we'll be happy. But actually, when we're happy, then the concentration comes together. And people, the, the aspiration of monasticism or of just practice and the ideals we hold ourselves to are so seductive that people can really be quite silly and sometimes quite like jerks to themselves and um, to others around them uh, because of holding it wrong. So to understand that um, this path is a joyful one and it should feel that way. Um, and if one feels oneself drying up, that's not a good sign. Um, Freud talked about two instincts in us, Thanatos, the death instinct, and Eros, the life instinct towards creation and love. Um, I think that Eros might be a bit like Chanda, uh, zeal. And when we, in this tradition, a real danger is we have all this heart and energy that we're pouring into it. And often when you step into a monastery or the tradition, the roots you see for that wellspring of love and energy and sincerity is all thanatos, all death instinct. Death instinct manifests as the superego, renunciation. Um, so like, I'm going to give up this, I'm going to cut this off, I'm going to eat little, sleep little, speak little. Um, and there's a place for that, for renunciation and for pushing away from things that are unwholesome. But if you only pour yourself into that, that sort of dead feel of thanatos, of the death instinct begins, you, you feel it over time and it makes people kind of shallow and like brittle and the heart dries up and you can see it in, in people who their hearts aren't being nourished. And then after four or five years in robes, they disrobe. Um, and often it's blamed on sexual lust or something, but it's really because the heart was destabilized from being withered. So an essential aspect on this path and in robes is to find a route for arrows for the love life instinct. Um, and that's the instinct of creation, of nourishment, um, of finding beauty, of uh, connection. So each of us has to find that, but it can be hard in a monastery or in an, a form of renunciation um, to find exactly how to do that. And you have to be creative. Um, so, uh, you know, for me, I, I write poetry pretty, pretty much daily. Um, or I like if I write every day, I really like it. There's four um, masculine archetypes that are spoken about. Magician, uh, lover, king, warrior. And uh, lovers, their prime instinct is to connect. And the, the shadow of the lover is the addict. But the, the lover archetype is also your creatives or the creative aspect in someone. The magician loves to play with knowledge. Um, that's the scholar types. Uh, then you have your kings and your warriors, sort of maybe long Sumedo and such. The Theravada is very good for kings and warriors. Um, magicians who love to play with knowledge and are scholars, um, that can be harder. But it's really important if, if you have that in you, and even if you don't, to find a root for that. That's your er Eros root, your root of joy and creation is studying. And I know monastics who just, and practitioners who love that aspect of pouring through the suttas, of learning language. Ajahn Kobilo is amazing at this. Um, and our tradition is very, very hard for lovers to navigate the creative types. And even if that's not your prime personality archetype, um, finding a route for that creative type is so essential. So finding, you know, an art form that might work for you in practice where you get to pour out this communion um, 
into the world and touching beauty. You know, the Christian monastic traditions, they don't have many, they have some meditative tools, but perhaps not as robust a tool belt as the Buddha gave us. And yet many of them keep their monastics their whole lives because they do have art and monastics um, aren't allowed to do every sort of art, but there are types we are allowed. Um, poetry, we are allowed, calligraphy. Um, I know monastics who work in workshops. And once again, this goes for all people on this path is, do you find your heart's drying up? Do you find you're pouring yourself into the practice by cutting things off in a way that begins to feel violent and brutal? And if so, can you begin to find these roots of giving, of connection, of communion, um, of calling forth to the beauty and the transcendent? Um, you know, this is essential because the Buddha gave us this clear form but if that's all we focus on is what we're giving up and holding back, it's like we built this cathedral. I've used this analogy before and our hands are, are pressed against the cold stone. And there's really a place for turning around and looking and calling to and seeing what that space has made room for the liturgy, the smoke of incense, the rose window blossoming on the floor. So find a route for Eros. And the ethic that you should look for in your own practice and the monastery you're going to is a flourishing normalcy and warmth. That's such an important criteria for moderns in practice, monastic and otherwise. And it, it's, um, it's heartbreaking to see how many people don't find that and end up falling away from the path because they, they haven't found that route to beauty, to communion, to metta in that sense. Meditation alone is rarely enough for people. You need, if you're in this for the long haul, you need to cultivate these other tools. And then if one does, you know, go forth or pursue this to know that the part of the mind that says like, oh, you're not cut out for this or you know, that may be the case for certain people. I'm not saying it's not, I'm not saying it is, but um, this form can be many things. I know monastics who run orphanages in, uh, in Northern Thailand. I know a monastic who uh, works in prisons, the Angulimala project in England. I know monastics who spend most of their time in seclusion. I know monastics who uh, spend most of their time studying and teaching. I know other ones who just love to work um, and pour cement and then meditate. Uh, I know others who go into seclusion uh, most of their years. And these robes, there's so much room for what you can be in them and what you can do. Um, it's worth, if, if, if this aspiration is in you, then to have faith in it. And, um, you know, try to, yeah, find a way to nourish your heart, find community, find these uh, ways of, of finding well-being, um, but also realize that you, you're going to have to be creative to make it work. Um, it's not easy, but it's, life isn't easy. Um, yeah, and then to remember that, that third aspect where Venerable Sariputta says, after one is content, what is hard to do to practice Dhamma in line with Dhamma. And that's where some of the structures the Buddha laid out are so good is you see monastics who really do get completely drawn into work or uh, admin or emails. Um, you know, I work with that certainly. And to remember that the Buddha set down three months a year, at least of retreat time of the rains and just to take that as a structure, to remember to pull in, to keep your daily meditation, to keep those retreat times and remember why you ordained. Um, the Buddha said, Nibbana is the goal and the ground of the holy life. So um, I didn't get to speak to explicitly the path of women seeking ordination. Um, some of those things I said will apply to them too. I'd say the part that won't is simply that it will take more exploration to find 
a place that is workable uh, and, and appropriate. Um, there's monasteries in the West Coast, uh, Karuna Buddhist Vihara in California with Aya Santusika and Ayajitananda. There's Dhamma Durini in California as well with Aya Tataloka. Um, there's Empty Cloud on the East Coast. Um, there's the Siladara form in England. Uh, and there's Bhikkhuni monasteries in uh, Europe as well. But it is a much more difficult path right now. And just to acknowledge that, um, but also say that we need women monastics more than we need them very badly. And um, if you have that in you, then trusting that aspiration, at least enough to explore a monastery. So once again, to end with a caveat, not everyone will be a monastic and that's uh, fine. And the real trick is to learn to honor the Dhamma, the duty of your life in that comma and to live it well and ordain in your heart. Um, and, and yet I find these reflections are relevant. Um, so let's do some questions. Please feel free to type them in. Do people need their parents' permission in order to ordain and tie force monasteries? Yes. Yeah, the, uh, the Buddha, you know, it's, it's actually one more moment of, of genius on his part is many monastic traditions actually have the child cut off uh, contact with their family. There's some uh, traditions in India that do that. And the Buddha said that bond is too important. The Tathagata does not ordain people without their parents' permission. So yeah, you need permission. You need to be out of debt. Um, but that's okay. Like most parents will give permission in the end. Um, and there's a story of Ratapala in the Majjhima Nikaya. He was a young man whose parents did not want him to ordain. And he basically just stopped eating and lay on the ground for three days until they agreed. Um, that's intense, but, uh, know that it doesn't necessarily happen right off the bat. And if it takes longer to bring them along, that's worth investing and worth being patient. I wanted to ordain, uh, leave college my junior year. And my parents were like, finish, finish college first. And I think that was probably a good decision for me. They were quite supportive, but, uh, also it's, it's a big step for a parent to take, to take on. My mom wrote an article called when my son became a Buddhist monk, you can find it under tricycle, uh, with that sort of navigation. But, um, once again, almost a hundred percent of parents come around in the end. So having faith in that, um, there's also a beautiful sutta where the Buddha says that if one's relatives, if you want one's rel your relatives to at death recall you with faith and their mind to become bright, uh, you should fulfill the precepts, not neglect meditation, etc. And I've always taken that as an indicator that at that moment of death, even if someone's personality and opinions during life kept them from appreciating or understanding what you do, as a practitioner. At death, there's a clarity where they will understand and it will brighten them. So even if to the end of your, their life, someone seems ambivalent or confused about your path, having faith that, that it's not, it still might be exactly what helps them at the moment of greatest need. Thank you, Ajahn. With regards to Sila Bhatta Paramasa, do you have any thoughts on communities that keep the Vinaya but tick all the boxes or some that may appear looser in Vinaya but have heart? So um, Sila Bhatta Paramasa means attachment to rites and rituals. Paramasa actually is the term of sort of fondling. So the belief that rites and rituals uh, have a power on their own to, um, separate from them being skillful means. I would say that heart is important, but ticking all the boxes is really also important because the boxes the Buddha gave us were really good boxes. And the slippery slope argument is a dangerous one to apply to different things. You know, people will be like, well, you allow this and then who knows what's next. And 
it can be used to make no accommodation. But also, like, it, it is relevant. These little things um, preserve a power in the structure. And you begin to fudge certain things, and, and a lot of things go. We're one of the few traditions that still doesn't touch money, even in the Buddhist world. It gets, it's so hard to keep that rule alive. Um, and you start fudging certain rules and the other ones can go very easily. Additionally, you don't always know why the Buddha established a rule. And sometimes what seems small is very significant. Um, Long Pramanindo compares when they were at Chithurst Monastery, they sort of were knocking down a wall and they checked to see if there's any supporting beams that they'd be knocking and so they sort of poked along the top of the wall and there was no no studs no no beams so they just knocked it over and then they looked and the whole ceiling started to bend and what it was is the beams were like this at a cross so they were supporting it but they didn't touch them they didn't realize they were knocking out a supporting x and similarly he says sometimes you don't know which rules are essential so for example the fact that we can't dig like that just seems minor and silly, but it's what keeps us from farming. It's what keeps communities from isolating themselves in spiritual bu bubbles. And uh, it, what, it's what makes us continue to rely on alms round. And if we rely on alms round, the communities remain moral because the, uh, they're really accountable to lay people. If the monks start to misbehave or the nuns start to misbehave, the lay people just stop feeding you. When, monasteries have started to farm for themselves, they become very large. And also then they're very vulnerable to uh, invasion and war. Uh, so in the Landa University in India, when the Muslim invasion swept in from the North, it was wiped out in one fell moment. And that could be said perhaps because they were storing, storing goods. So little rules have large effect. You have to find a balance, but the Vinaya, and the boxes are good boxes. And um, yeah, if you're going to alter any, it should still be with, in line of the original vinia. And any alteration should be really carefully run past uh, a senior teacher who's trustworthy. And in the monastic tradition, that means a mahatera, uh, 20 vases or more. Um, do not alter this, you know, you don't alter the vinia, but it's embodiment in Korwat. Um, there's small things we, you know, we can change that are still within line of the monastic code, um, but that shouldn't be something done lightly ever and should be run past relevant authorities. Ajahn, are all bhikkhus and bhikkhunis expected to give Dhamma talks if requested? Is it optional? It is optional, yes. Um, Monastics don't have to, and some monastics are very shy, and that's beautiful. Um, I also re am reminded of one story, Long Propasano, when he was co-abbot of Abayagiri with Ajahn Amaro, some Saturday nights, there'd be the Dhamma talk, and he would get up, and there'd be the Dhamma talk request, and you know, some people had, been dri had driven from Mendocino for it, and Long Por would just say, nothing's coming up right now. And that was it. That was the Dhamma talk. And what a great teaching, like nothing's arising at the moment. Ajahn Amaro said, I could, I could never do that, but it made him respect Longpur so much. Uh, so yes, not all monastics teach. And the Buddha was very, um, yeah, he was very cautious about, uh, he compared monastics to a horse. Its strength was the Four Noble Truths. Its ability to gain requisites, I think, is its beauty and its ability to, or the monastic's ability to explain the Dhamma, I think, I, I might be getting this wrong, but is right proportions. And you notice of those three, the only thing that really matters is its strength, its speed. Uh, right proportions and beauty aren't terribly important. So what matters in a monastic, as in any practitioner, is their realization of the Four Noble Truths and awakening, not these other aspects. Okay. Oh gosh, uh, we do have to move to Zoom, but this last question is uh, a good one. 
Do most Western monastics rely in some ways on their families as financial backstop because of the more difficult environment in the West? And what are those who have no such support system? Um, some do. We aren't allowed to ask for things uh, from those who haven't invited us to ask, except for our immediate families. So it is a good support. And I think the Buddha allowed that for good reason, because there are times when you need to ask for something. Um, but there's also a real vulnerability um, that I find most monastics are able to approach. And, um, you know, the power, there is faith that rises to meet you. Um, my first alms round in Pike Place no one had signed up and seven people offered within a half an hour. Uh, the devas and the dhamma will protect you, but to do it, you need to surrender. And um, I'll just leave with this story of a, a saint. Um, I've referenced her before, but she left her home in medieval Italy to seek out the desert fathers. And uh, she ran away in the middle of the night with one coin to buy bread. And as she was exiting the door, she heard this voice that said, do you have faith in me or a coin? And she said, you, Lord, and threw down the coin and left. And it's so easy to justify one coin, but the difference between that and complete surrender is, is everything. I, it's, it's, it's everything. And it's what our lives as practitioners hinge on, and it's what this monastery project hinges on. So I think it's always interesting to look at, are we holding a coin? Are we hedging our bets or do we have faith in the path? Okay. So I'm sure we can continue this dis discussion on Zoom. For those who don't know, what we do next is uh, we have a more intimate conversation on Zoom. So I've just posted the link in the chat. I'll log on in a second to let people in. If you can't see the link, go to... Um, clearmountainmonastery.org and halfway down the page you'll see a Wednesday evening live or Zoom and live stream and the link will be there. Uh, and until then, good luck everyone. Um, just to mention this Saturday we'll have Ajahn Jyoti Palo joining us, a senior Ajahn uh, at Blodell. So it'll be really fun. I hope you all are there. And um, if you haven't looked at our update section of our uh, website, we have a bunch of upcoming events for June that are really heartening, including a visit from Longpo Pasano, Ayananda Bodhi, Ayasantusika, and Ayajitananda. Take care.